thank you very much and, uh, and very glad to, um, to be here this afternoon. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, this is also a very important moment for, um, uh, for the country and uh, um, I really hope that uh, everything will um, uh, move in the, in the best possible direction. Um, when it comes to the enlargement process and uh, when I was asked to um, uh, do this job, I was asking myself whether it was a, a good offer that had been made or it was a sort of impoisoned uh, gift. Um, I still believe that it was a good offer, but it is true that uh, I would say that enlargement has turned into a relatively uh, difficult sell in the last few, uh, um, in the last few years. Um, um, there are a number of elements that need to be um, uh, reconciled in this context uh, uh, and how to keep one, the first one is how to keep the process credible and the uh, perspective of enlargement uh, uh, real for the uh, um, countries covered by the process itself. Uh, but at the same time, we need to take into account the uh, orientations of our public opinion and uh, the fact that um, it has become less and less popular, uh, uh, the idea of enlarging further the uh, European Union, especially uh, um, since the beginning of the, of the crisis. Um, it is also, and this is an, an, another difficult element, to reconcile the expectations of the candidates or the potential candidates because they would like to join, to join soon, rapidly, uh, without difficulties. But at the same time, uh, um, the process has turned into a much more complex one compared with it used to be uh, um, uh, in the past. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, the, the difficulty is really in trying to reconcile the ambition of the uh, enlargement process and to move the enlargement agenda forward with the reality on the ground, both in our member states and in uh, the countries covered by the process itself. Um, if we want to um, compare the uh, um, uh, the present process with the fifth enlargement, the one that was covering the uh, uh, countries of Central and Eastern uh, Europe, there are a number of substantial differences. Uh, in quality, I would say, first of all, because essentially during the fifth enlargement, the countries were asked to uh, um, uh, formally adopt the acquis, but there was no time left to uh, uh, check whether this was implemented properly. Um, while uh, uh, now the process is much more focused not only on the legal framework, but on the uh, capacity of the countries to implement it on what we call the track record, which is uh, a, a way of making it sure that the process is irreversible and it's, uh, and it's not, not going to, uh, to change. Um, but also in quantitative terms, there are some substantial changes. A number of new chapters have been added and uh, uh, not certainly the easiest ones. I'm referring in particular to what in jargon are the chapter 23 and 24. Chapter 23 covers the judiciary and fundamental freedoms. And when it comes to fundamental freedoms, it means uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, rights of minority, Roma, LGTB population. So a number of uh, uh, quite complicated issues in, uh, uh, even in the countries of the EU and certainly in the, in the countries of the region of the covered by the enlargement process. In Chapter 24, it is a chapter on, uh, on uh, justice, liberty, and security, which are all the conditions that, are, uh, and that need to be met in order for the countries to join the Schengen process. Um, so you, I mean, it's two chapters that are very substantial <coughs> um, and are, have an impact in, uh, a substantial impact in the process. Another aspect that is uh, looked at much more carefully uh, um, compared with the uh, past enlargement uh, is the reform of public administration. And here again, uh, um, uh, this is, uh, um, is a very important point, the depolitization of the process, merit-based, 
um, no uh, ad hoc vacancies. So it's a, a, a quite, um, quite huge road <coughs> to go. Um, and last but not least, uh, um, we are requesting the countries uh, uh, to uh, develop institutions that are able to manage effectively the European funds. Uh, so essentially, uh, we want to make it sure that uh, once they join, the countries have the, institute, the, the proper institutional setting for uh, managing social, regional, or um, agricultural funds and to get ready for, uh, um, for this process. And this has implication in terms of uh, um, corruption, fight against corruption, which is linked with that, but also auditing systems, auditing mechanisms that are all, uh, quite significant. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think that this is a negative development. I mean, I'm not complaining about, um, um, about this. I think that um, uh, the idea of be having the countries ready for uh, uh, the enlargement and for becoming member of the union and taking up the responsibilities of membership uh, is certainly an important and positive development. Um, what worries me a little bit more uh, is the fact that there is a trend to advance the requests. So uh, um, uh, while I have an understanding that uh, 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 this criteria must be fulfilled at the moment when uh, the negotiations evolve substantially, my preoccupation is that when we start asking uh, uh, too many things even before the process starts, because this is creating a sense, especially in uh, uh, the uh, in the potential candidates or in the candidates, a sense that we are creating new obstacles that are making the, their life much more difficult and, and, and complicated. And um, right or wrong, the perception uh, um, is there and, and stays. Um, still, uh, uh, <coughs> let's say, looking at the horizontal issues before going to um, a more to a sort of analysis country by country, last element that I would like to underline is the, uh, the fact that the process has become much less linear than it used to be in the past. Uh, during the fifth enlargement, there was a sort of political decision. There were a number of countries or groups of countries that, that were more or less homogeneous with the same kind of problems and with the same kind of expectations. Now we have a situation where uh, the enlargement process applies to Turkey, to Iceland, and to the Western Balkans. That are already three different entities. And within the Western Balkans, there are very different realities, also uh, from the, not only from the political, but also from the ethnic point of view. So there is a certain uh, uh, differentiation uh, that needs to be made. And that's why we are moving towards a process that is no longer a sort of one size fits all, but much more into a sort of tailor-made approach where for each country we are trying to identify the best modalities to uh, make it sure that uh, the countries can <coughs> move towards the, uh, uh, the goal of the negotiations and can uh, um, uh, benefit from, uh, from the process itself. Um, turning to uh, um, the, uh, um, the countries, um, Essentially, for the moment, the process uh, um, is applicable to nine countries. I will start with the, uh, uh, the champion, Croatia, <laughs> that uh, uh, has successfully completed the uh, uh, negotiations uh, uh, last year and uh, uh, is supposed to join in uh, July 2013. Um, it's a very... Um, process is moving uh, in a very constructive and positive way. Uh, the European Council has asked the, uh, the Commission to monitor the, uh, um, the process. There were specifically two areas uh, where 
we need to um, uh, give our <coughs> attention in particular. One is the area for the cluster of rule of law, the reform of the judiciary, the fight against corruption, where I think that Croatia has managed to show and prove that it um, uh, is not afraid of going even uh, on a very tough line. Uh, I was mentioning uh, uh, during this morning that the, in the Balkans there is a, uh, um, a word that has been created, that is sana de risazia, after the uh, arrest of the uh, former prime minister um, in Croatia. And, uh, uh, but this means that really the feeling is that there are no sanctuaries and no fear to uh, uh, touch even the most delicate issues and the most delicate uh, uh, elements of the, of the state. Um, so we are having this monitoring exercise. Uh, we have uh, uh, issued the first uh, report in April, um, which was uh, uh, constructive, positive. It was also true that uh, it was covering a period which was very <coughs> complicated politically for Croatia. It was during the elections period, so the change of government and the creation of a new administration. But in spite of that, there was some significant progress being made. And now we expect in the second report in uh, uh, October. And uh, um, we are confident that uh, uh, we could have very uh, uh, positive results in that context. Um, the other country uh, that uh, um, is, I'll say, quite advanced in the negotiating process at this stage is Iceland. Uh, we have uh, uh, opened already 15 chapters out of 35, 10 have been or provisionally closed already. Um, we are planning to uh, um, open, uh, hopefully, four more chapters before the end of the Danish presidency and uh, uh, to have another substantial number during the uh, um, Cyprus presidency. Um, I would say that for me the main challenge uh, in, uh, in the negotiations with, uh, with Iceland remains in the fishery sector. I mean, I'll be relatively, I'm trying to simplify, there are many other small uh, aspects that are complicated and needs to be taken uh, uh, into account, but fisheries is the, uh, the area which is more uh, sensitive for the European Union and for, uh, uh, for Iceland. So very much will be decided around the negotiations on, on the fishery sector, and the negotiation is made more complex by the fact that uh, uh, the European Union uh, is uh, um, reforming the uh, fishery policy, yeah. and, the, uh, and the Icelanders are reforming their fishery policy. So we are negotiating on the basis of variable, uh, of moving targets, and uh, uh, this is not making life easy. And the perspective of the uh, uh, parliamentary elections in 2013 in Iceland are an element which is further complicating the, uh, the picture. But uh, on, the, on, the post, on the more positive side is the fact that the administration is very good, is very well motiv motivated, and uh, uh, we are working together very well in order to see how to best address this, uh, uh, these issues. And I'd be glad to um, come back on that. I understand that in Ireland you have a keen interest to understand how the, <laughs> the fishery uh, negotiation is going to develop. Um, before moving to the, uh, to the Western Balkans, uh, 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 a few words on Turkey, which is, uh, I would say, one of the most uh, uh, difficult negotiations that we are facing now. Uh, the relations between the EU and Turkey are characterized by a sort, by a sort of, I would say, mirroring schizophrenic attitude. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, Turkey represents for Europe a particular important partner, a key strategic partner from uh, um, all points of view, economic, commercial, uh, uh, political, and foreign policy. I mean, it's self-evident. Um, but I would say, and, but when it comes to the decision to uh, move from, let's say, the, uh, the level of strategic partnership into that of 
joining the same club, then things become more complicated. Uh, I have to say that there is a sort of uh, mirroring uh, situation in Turkey, uh, and I mean, what was valid for Europe is valid also for Turkey. I mean, I have to say that the more than 60% uh, of the Turkish trade is with European Union, uh, more than 80% of the foreign direct investments in Turkey are coming from the European Union. So, I mean, uh, there is a bulk of, let's say, communality <coughs> between uh, 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 Turkey and the EU that is difficult to be, uh, um, uh, to be underestimated. Uh, the customs union has created a lot of this kind of interdependence. Um, but then uh, 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 Turkey is now, I would say, also uh, um, <coughs> introducing these elements of possible alternatives, that Europe is not the only possible way forward. Uh, Northern Africa, Middle East, Central Asia are very often mentioned. Um, again, I think that the, uh, uh, the inter connections are such that it's difficult to imagine how we can disentangle these two realities. And the fact that energy is turning into a hub for the uh, energy distribution from uh, uh, Middle East and Central Asia into Europe is making this point even uh, more, uh, let's say, um, uh, stronger. Um, in order to uh, avoid this sort of uh, uh, difficult situation, uh, or at least to uh, see if we could manage to change some of the variables of these equations, we have uh, um, uh, devised a new approach in the relations with, uh, between the European Union and Turkey, which we have tried to summarize in what we have called uh, and baptized as the positive agenda. Uh, in order to, uh, say, to move away from the uh, blame game about the uh, um, uh, lack <coughs> of implementation of the Ankara Protocol, of uh, our uh, uh, the European Union uh, uh, lack of agreement on the uh, uh, trade ag on the trade agreement for uh, Northern Cyprus. Um, the, the positive agenda has two, I would say, two elements. One is to uh, um, how to manage the areas of a disagreement, which is already a quite relevant point. I mean, in, uh, if we can manage to have a way of dealing with it in a more constructive um, uh, feature. But on, on the other side, we would like to shift more into the positive aspects of our relation and have tried to identify a number of areas where we can work together more constructively. Um, energy is one of those, uh, and there is already a real dialogue which I started uh, um, some weeks ago. We will, uh, uh, in, in, on the 17th of May, uh, Commission Schiele will uh, in, uh, have a kickoff meeting on uh, um, the overall process of approximation of legislation. So we will start working on a number of areas that have been stuck and blocked for some time in, um, uh, in the Council. And that includes also uh, the areas of the uh, judiciary and fundamental freedoms, uh, uh, which I think it's a very relevant and very important uh, at this stage uh, in Turkey. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other uh, um, part, which is also very relevant and for Turkey, is visa liberalization, um, where um, a political agreement has already been reached uh, in, uh, in the Council uh, and has to be now mm -hmm. translated into a proper dialogue and into concrete actions that we will follow and that should lead, let's say, um, over time to uh, a, a full visa liberalization. Um, it's not me, but I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the first things that, uh, uh, first messages coming from, uh, uh, from Turkey after the uh, uh, elections in France, the presidential election in France, is that can we open some of the chapters that have been blocked by France? <laughs> oh, <very good. laughs> so we will, uh, I'm just say, saying this as a sort of, uh, uh, of joke, but it's, uh, um, there is a, also an expectation that there could be a sort of new uh, um, uh, attitude in, uh, within the European Union. Um, 
let me move to the uh, to the Western Balkans. And I have taken Croatia out of it because I think that at the end of the day, Croatia um, is a sort of completion of the uh, <coughs> Central European enlargement process more than a Western Balkan. So I think this is a country between the two. But now the how to say the game starts with the um, uh, with the other countries. First on the list for me is Montenegro. Montenegro has um, uh, has been given a very clear task last year. We were we had identified a number of uh, uh, key priorities that they need to uh, uh, look after. Um, reform area which were very relevant: uh, public administration, uh, judiciary. Um, uh, fight against corruption, fight against organized crime, uh, fundamental freedoms. Uh, they have done a remarkable job in, uh, uh, during this period, a really remarkable job. The new government led by uh, uh, Prime Minister Lukšić has been uh, truly committed to the European uh, cause and to the uh, uh, European perspective. And they have turned the European agenda into a national agenda. So it has really permeated <laughs> the uh, political decisions of the country, and still is the case. And they have done this with uh, um, flexibility, with intelligence, and with speed. There are limits to what can be done in a year. That's true. And so uh, uh, we cannot imagine that the uh, results are, uh, uh, especially when it comes to track record, and to the establishment of track record results are over ambitious, but they have done a very serious job, and I think that they deserve to uh, uh, be given uh, uh, the possibility of opening the negotiations, as I hope and as I expect to happen uh, at the end of June, uh, as it had been, uh, let's say, foreseen in the conclusions of the European Council in December. Um, Macedonia. Uh, you know that Macedonia has been, uh, it's now in the third year in a row that we have uh, suggested and proposed the Council to open the negotiations. Uh, this has always been, uh, um, been blocked. Um, we have launched, in order to uh, see how we could overcome the difficulties and the problems of the um, relations with Macedonia, we have launched what we have defined in high-level accession dialogue. Um, we started in March. Um, it was, uh, uh, the, the, this dialogue is co-chaired by the Prime Minister of Macedonia and uh, Commissioner Fuller, the Commissioner for Enlargement. We have had a, an, another session just uh, uh, last week, at the beginning of May. Um, and there will be a third round in September, and in the meantime, we will have a number of technical missions in uh, June and July. Uh, the dialogue is focused, I mean, uh, Macedonia has done always quite well in the adoption of the acquis. Uh, they have been quite, uh, uh, let's say, efficient in the area of the adoption of the acquis but they have been a little bit more problematic in uh, some areas like uh, freedom of expression, and you may remember last year there were a few uh, problematic aspects. In the holding of the elections, the OSC ODEA was complaining about a number of uh, elements of the, uh, um, of the elections. Uh, um, in the area of the uh, fight against corruption, and in the uh, functioning of the market, so what we uh, in Dragoon call it the, the functioning market economy status. So we have taken exactly these areas, the complicated ones, and we have turned it into a sort of open dialogue with, uh, um, with, the, um, with the Macedonians. And I have to say that the experiment uh, uh, is really pro giving some very um, good results. Uh, they and as underlined, they have come up with specific targets to be achieved in these areas. They have defined an action plan with 140 measures that they have undertaken to, uh, um, to complete by September. Um, I think that it's a, it's a, a very uh, um, bold move 
it uh, uh, provides a change of perspective in, uh, um, in, the, in, in Macedonia and in the relations of Macedonia with the European Union. And it's something that will need to be followed up and followed closely to see if which is kind of results can, uh, can produce in the future. Um, but in that case too, we see the uh, European agenda becoming a national agenda and let's say um, uh, absorbing in a constructive way the energies of the political parties and of the civil society in, uh, in Macedonia. Um, third on the list, <coughs> and don't be surprised, is Albania. Albania uh, has gone through a very uh, difficult period uh, last year. Between uh, uh, June and November, uh, there was a real, uh, how to say, confrontation between government and opposition, um, and a, a very, uh, um, let's say, unhealthy situation, I would say, from the point of view of the uh, normal functioning of the institutions. Uh, the, uh, um, the opposition was not taking part in the voting in, uh, in Parliament and was de facto blocking a number of laws which were uh, in, uh, requiring a three-fifth majority. Uh, the government uh, was playing hardball when it was coming to a number of uh, um, uh, important elements uh, in the elections uh, um, and in uh, uh, the dealings with, the, uh, with some independent institutions. So there was a difficult situation. Um, after a, um, let's say, uh, many efforts being done and uh, a little bit of also of help and support on our side, in November last year, the uh, um, Albanians had managed government opposition to find an agreement, um, which was based on three main aspects. Uh, uh, an agreement to complete the electoral reform, um, on changing the rules of procedure of the parliament, amending the rules of procedure of the parliaments, and uh, um, uh, unblocking the, uh, uh, the, the vote on uh, the laws requiring a three-fifth majority. This has worked. I mean, essentially, uh, most of this uh, package has been implemented. Um, and uh, uh, I was particularly happy to see that uh, all political leaders, president, prime ministers, leader of the opposition, president of the parliament, everybody, joined in uh, celebrating the Europe Day in Tirana, which uh, it's a, how to say, a good signal from all points of view. Um, the next uh, challenge that uh, 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 Albania has to face is the election of the president of the republic. We will see. I mean, for the moment, uh, what we see that is the uh, it's a, a, at least is calm, and uh, um, we'll have to, it's an, an indirect election. So it's the parliament with, you know, which is doing this. But the process that will be leading to uh, the election will be the most important point. And so far, so good. Um, we will uh, we will understand more in the uh, in the coming months. Uh, they are continuing also in the reform process, uh, and uh, um, they have uh, um, come up with an action plan which was very convincing uh, in order to implement the different um, uh, elements of reform that are needed to uh, um, to be to be implemented. If, 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 if all the things fall in the right place, um, we believe that Albania should be uh, given a real chance and uh, uh, to be given a real chance to uh, get the candidate status. It's too early to say it now, but if the um, trend will continue in a constructive way, uh, it will be um, a real possibility. Um, <coughs> I will try to uh, go a little bit more rapidly for the other countries, not because they are less, less relevant, but because there are more um, element, variable elements that are difficult to uh, uh, define at this stage. Serbia. Uh, Serbia was provided, was given, uh, granted the candidate status in March, then the electoral process started. We are still, I would say, not in the middle of it, but towards the end. 
parliamentary and presidential elections have been called, the parliamentary elections have given, uh, let's say, super majority to the present um, uh, coalition that is supposed to uh, continue. We will see after the 20th of May who will be uh, the president. And uh, uh, if the uh, 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 pro-European uh, majority will be confirmed, we hope that uh, uh, there, can, there will be also more clear stand, let's say, taken on uh, uh, two main issues that are relevant for us. One is northern Kosovo, uh, and uh, uh, I would say the normalizations of the relations with Kosovo, but again, the normalization of the relations with Kosovo go through the solution of the northern Kosovo issue. And there is a uh, positive and encouraging signal in the fact that President Tadic has presented a sort of plan, the so-called four points, uh, where he is ruling out the uh, possibility of partition of Kosovo and is working only on the idea <coughs> of the defense of the interest of the Serbs living in Kosovo. Uh, the other aspect that will need to be taken into account is the reform process that, how to say, in these last few months has been, let's put it this way, less um, result-oriented than uh, uh, we would have expected. Um, but with the, uh, the new government and the new ministers in place, we hope that this can, uh, can uh, change. Um, Bosnia Herzegovina, I suppose that I can say very little because you have gotten, you have had Ambassador Sorensen uh, just uh, uh, a few weeks ago here, um, and he has given you a, a much, let's say, an insight of the, uh, uh, of the situation. What I would like to say is that the um, uh, atmosphere in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina is, is much more constructive in the last uh, um, few months, I would say since the beginning of the year, more or less. This has led to the uh, uh, formation of the government, uh, which um, I would say uh, was a real uh, problem for uh, uh, many months and to the uh, uh, adoption of a number of key laws, including the stated law and the census laws, which were very, uh, very relevant. We are now encouraging them to work on the um, 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 adaptation that of the constitutions that are needed to um, um, adjust the constitution to the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, both for the election of the president and the election of representative in the House of People. Uh, still problematic because when it comes to changing the constitution and, and uh, the, the, uh, the Bosniaks are a little bit more uh, reluctant uh, to, uh, to move forward. Uh, the other problem that we are uh, 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 experiencing, it's a very um, uh, important one, is the need for Bosnia Herzegovina to be able to speak with, with one voice when it comes to the relations with the European Union. Um, I can negotiate with the counterpart, but I cannot negotiate with uh, 10 cantons, two entities, one state level uh, in a separate setting. I mean, it's, uh, they have to be able to find a way of and they can do whatever they want. They can change the constitution, they can pass a law, they can even do nothing and just having a sort of political agreement. But there is a need to find a way of creating the conditions for being able to speak with one voice with the European Union. We will try to help them in that. We have agreed now to have the high level consultations on the 27th of June in Brussels. We have invited the uh, three presidents, I mean the three members of the presidency, the three prime ministers of the state level and of the uh, uh, two entities, and the uh, six leaders of the political parties in uh, the countries, in the countries in order to see if we can manage to uh, uh, move forward. Uh, so, work in progress, I would say. Um, final word on, uh, on Kosovo. Um, um, I would say that uh, uh, in March, 
uh, this year there has been a real breakthrough uh, in the relations between the European Union and Kosovo. Um, the decisions of the Council to uh, a given mandate to the Commission for a feasibility study for a stabilization association agreement is really a sort of breaking news, to be honest, because this is the basis of a possible contractual relation between uh, uh, Kosovo and the EU. We are not yet there. It's a challenge from all points of view. It's a challenge also for Kosovo, as I'm <coughs> telling the Kosovans. The study will assess the feasibility, so your capacity to, uh, uh, to do uh, this kind of work. So it will be a challenge also for the administration. But I have to say that uh, the uh, Kosovo administration, when put in front of a clear challenge, has also been able to respond very positively, as it has been the case for the um, um, roadmap uh, for visa liberalization. Visa liberalization will also be an important, uh, another important feature of uh, the work that we are doing together. And in this context, we are launching a dialogue on rule of law uh, that will start at the end of May, May 30, um, where we hope to be able to, let's say, highlight and identify together with them a number of areas where um, substantial work is needed. And to end on a more post, even more positive note is the fact that uh, the, uh, my understanding that there is an agreement to uh, um, have um, Kosovo join the EBRD, uh, uh, let's say, in September. That's the, uh, um, that's the um, expectation. The North, I have already spoken about it, coming uh, speaking about Serbia, is an, an element that needs to be uh, dealt as well. Um, I've spoken a lot, uh, more than I expected. I've been longer than uh, the 25 minutes. <laughs> that have. Just to say that uh, for the Irish presidency, um, it will be, a, a, I mean, the, the, the semester will be extremely important because we are having a sort of cycle by which the pro we presented a progress report in October, the uh, council uh, uh, adopts some conclusions in December, and then the, the following months are the months of the implementation of this. So it will be essentially that's during the, uh, the presidency, uh, the Irish presidency. But it's also true that uh, uh, we have broken a little bit the scheme of dealing with the enlargement only in uh, mm -hmm. December, uh, and it may be, and it well may be, that. Uh, uh, if the delays are occurring in Albania, Macedonia, or Serbia, uh, the Irish presidency will be called to play an even more relevant role in, uh, in uh, these areas. And uh, uh, same goes for Iceland. The elections will fall during the period of the presidency. And same goes for Turkey. It because your presidency will follow that of Cyprus, and that will be the moment when essentially the relations between uh, uh, the EU and Turkey will need probably to be um, um, uh, re-energized. Ambassador, I will stop there. I won't try to make conclusions, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much indeed, Director General.